racing to be first has been ingrained in mankind's DNA for millennia. Our innate desire to stand apart from the rest of the pack fuels us forward in all walks of life. In sports, we see this in the Olympic 100-meter dash, the Tour de France, the Kentucky Derby, and so many more. The prizes are exorbitant, and the viewership is astronomical. There's an incredible audience just to spectate history in the making. In medicine, the need to be first is often a race against time. The amount of research, money, and hours put into developing life-saving drugs is staggering. It's a gigantic industry and is vital during the age we live in now. Still, others strive to be first for the grand accomplishment of doing what no one else has done before. This is the case with Mount Everest. Standing as the highest mountain on planet Earth, many climbers over the course of decades would attempt to scale the treacherous slopes. All failed, and some unfortunate souls lost their lives in this pursuit. Victory was achieved simultaneously by two very different men in 1953. A New Zealander by the name of Sir Edmund Hillary, and a Sherpa from Nepal, Tenzing Norgay. Their story and lifelong kinship afterwards make them hidden gems of history. Discovered as the highest peak in the world in 1852 by Bengali mathematician Radhanath Sikdar, Mount Everest stands an impressive 29,029 feet above sea level, which is roughly five and a half miles of pure mountain. Everest's namesake comes from George Everest, a British surveyor that ironically never saw Everest. Andrew Scott Waugh recommended the name after his mentor, George, and was accepted as the official title of the mountain in 1856. By the early 1920s, plans to scale the behemoth were in the works. The early British attempts were made on the north face, or the Tibetan side of the mountain, the most famous of which was in 1924. The British mountain expedition of 1924 started fairly successfully. Edward Norton reached a height of 28,126 feet, the record at that time. While undeniably impressive, it was still just short of the summit, less than 1,000 feet away. Making their way for another attempt at the summit was George Mallory, a senior British officer, and Andrew Irvine, an engineering student. On paper, this seemed like a strong duo. Mallory was the chief climber, a title that which was given to the most experienced and talented climber of the group, and Irvine was no slouch either. While not the most seasoned mountaineer, Irvine's expertise came with the use of oxygen tanks, an extremely important part of high elevation climbing. Despite their skill, the attempt would end in tragedy. There's a ton of speculation as to what exactly occurred, but due to a late start in the day, a storm picked up and at some point, the two climbers were injured and fell to their deaths. Some of the original expedition members believed the duo made it all the way to the summit, but the general public and experts claim the feat was highly unlikely due to circumstances. With no proof of an ascent, the race for the top would continue. Very few expeditions were made in the next decade. The loss of Mallory and Irvine stunned the climbing community, not much progress occurs even after the mountain is reopened. It was beginning to seem that no one could defeat Everest. In 1950, the Chinese took over Tibet and promptly closed the north side of the mountain. This setback wasn't without a silver lining, however. Nepal had recently opened its border, and unbeknownst to the mountain climbers, the south side and face of Everest was easier to climb and remains today as the standard path to reach the summit. Even with the Nepalese cooperating in reaching the highest place on earth, it was still going to take a perfect combination of strategy, skill, and personnel to reach the top. The last of which would ultimately make the difference as two climbers with vastly different backgrounds joined the historic campaign in 1953. They were Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay.
Edmund Hillary's family emigrated from Yorkshire, England in the mid-19th century to New Zealand. While Edmund was a gifted student, graduating primary school two years early, and his family was stable financially, things were not perfect for Ed growing up. He was shy and a bit shorter than most of his classmates in his youth. He did well early in school, but struggled with mathematics and science as the years went on, leading him to dropping out of school altogether before he was the age of 20. He struggled to make friends and find purpose in his life. He had a variety of different careers and hobbies that would often involve the risk of injury or pain. He participated in boxing and joined his family business as a beekeeper. I learned in my research for this project that a fancy name for a beekeeper is an apiarist, but there was nothing fancy about what Edmund was doing. He would transport hives from location to location, all the while being exposed to angry bees. Hillary estimated he was stung somewhere between 18 to 100 times a day while working. Not surprisingly, this job didn't turn into a career for the young New Zealander. In Edmund's search for meaning, he joined a movement called Radiant Living. Not much is known about Radiant Living, but the group did change Hillary. He spent five years in this short-lived religion, but his association would set the precedent for how he would approach the rest of his life. He said in regards to Radiant Living, I learned to speak confidently from the platform, to think more freely on important topics, to mix more readily with a wide variety of people. Edmund's social and physical prowess would improve as his interest in outdoors, hiking, and climbing increased. No longer the small fry, Hillary stood at a whopping 6 feet 2 inches and was incredibly athletic and strong. He served in the army and fought for New Zealand's version of the Air Force. Through mountain climbing, Edmund made his first meaningful friends. In 1939, he climbed Mount Oliver with Harry Ayres and George Lowe. It was the first major climb in Hillary's illustrious career and went on to climb with George Lowe in several more expeditions. Unlike Hillary, Tenzing Norgay, born Namgel Wang Di did not have a comfortable life or upbringing. He was born in May of 1914 and was the 11th of 13 children. Norgay did not have the same luxuries or opportunities Hillary did. We don't even have the exact day in the month Tenzing was born. He grew up in Thame, Nepal and worked for a Sherpa family. A Sherpa is both a group of people and an occupation. Sherpas live at the base of the Himalayan mountains in China, controlled Tibet, or Nepal. They are also known for their extraordinary strength and skill navigating mountains. Sherpas have been scaling the Himalayas and helping expeditions for over 70 years. Nepal's economy depends greatly on the Sherpa community. It's estimated that 4% of Nepal's national revenue comes from Mount Everest tourism alone. That's over $500 million a year generated off the backs of Sherpas. Tenzing Norgay was given said name upon advice from the Elder Lama from his Buddhist congregation. It roughly translates to a wealthy or fortunate religious follower. During his adolescence, the name may be seen as a bit ironic. By no means was he a wealthy man, and although he was a Buddhist, he decided to be a mountain climber and a Sherpa to expeditions instead of becoming a monk. His first major mountain climbing experience was on an expedition to Everest in 1935. He was the last one chosen and only made it for two reasons. First, two other Sherpas failed medical tests, and secondly, he had an iconic smile that caught the attention of the leaders of the campaign. He proved himself useful for the group as a porter, A porter is basically a pack mule with more responsibilities. Norgay's role would include carrying heavy equipment between each camp, preparing each route ahead of the main climbers, and all the grunt work left over, deemed undignified of a royal British officer. This first experience for Norgay was actually quite instrumental in the famous ascent 
he and Hillary would take nearly 20 years later. It was determined through scouting and reconnaissance that the mountain could best be defeated from the south side or on the Nepal side of Everest. However, as stated before, Nepal would not open its border to climbers for another 15 years. Tenzing Norgay climbed up the ranks from Porter to Sherpa all the way to full-fledged party member. In 1952, Tenzing Norgay, along with Raymond Lampert, would reach new heights for man. The duo made it all the way to 28,215 feet, the record for any climber at that time. So close to the summit, but still more than 800 feet from the top. People were starting to close in on Everest, and Norgay was determined to be a part of history. Norgay and Hillary's path would finally cross in 1953. John Hunt led the group of over 400 party members, including 362 porters and 20 Sherpa guides, to the base of Everest in late March. It was a magnanimous assault, one full of hardships, struggles, speculation, and success. This story was so large it couldn't be contained in just one episode. Highlighting two amazing men deserves two fantastic episodes. You'll hear all about the actions of Tenzing Norgay as he saved Edmund Hillary's life from certain peril and the strides made by the New Zealander to honor that heroic act, as well as what kind of legacy Norgay and Hillary leave today on the very next Hidden Gems of History. If you have someone in mind who you think should be highlighted as a hidden gem of history, or just want to learn about an undervalued time in history, feel free to email the show at hiddengemsofhistory at gmail.com with your suggestion. Hidden Gems of History could not be made without the help of so many people. This episode especially could not be made without my father. As a lifelong fan of mountain climbing, his expertise and passion was crucial for both understanding the history of Everest and the magnitude of scaling such a behemoth. Thanks, Dad. And thank you for joining me. I'm Matt Dahlberg, and this has been Hidden Gems of History. <laughs>